Hello and welcome back to Manifolds, the video series where we extend our knowledge of differentiation and integration to generalized surfaces. And in fact, we've already learned that these generalized surfaces can also have boundaries and in today's part 47, we extend the notions of a tangent space and the orientation to this boundary. This is really needed because the famous theorem of Stokes is a connection theorem between the manifold and its boundary. But as always, before we start with the explicit definitions, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget that you can find exercises and quizzes with the link in the description. Okay, then let's immediately start by considering a manifold with a boundary. So in this picture you see a two-dimensional manifold M and the boundary we have is a one-dimensional manifold. And as you already know, the common notation for the boundary of the manifold is del M. And if we ignore this boundary, then for each point P on the manifold we find a tangent space TPM. It's well defined as a vector space spanned by the tangent vectors. And as you might remember, these tangent vectors can be defined by considering curves on the manifold through the point P. Therefore, we should be able to do the same thing for a point Q on the boundary. There, also the tangent vectors should span our tangent space. However, the difference now is in order to define the tangent vectors, we would also consider curves that stop at the point Q. Indeed, this is the only difference we have compared to our tangent space on the manifold M itself. But this also means that we can distinguish three different kinds of tangent vectors. You see, we can have one that points outwards coming from the manifold. We could have the opposite where the vector points inwards inside the manifold. And finally, the third case would be something in the middle where we have a tangent vector on the boundary of M. In other words, this third case would be the standard tangent space of the boundary of M as a manifold. And with that, I would say we have all the ideas we need to define TQM for a boundary point Q. This means essentially we can redo the definition we have already given in part 21. So we don't need the whole manifold M, just a neighborhood around the point Q. So in a rough sketch, we just have part of the boundary the inside of the manifold and the outside of the manifold. And as already mentioned, we can consider different curves, for example, some that run into the point Q. And we can also have the curves that come out of Q. And the last case would be the case that we run on the boundary through the point Q. And now you know from part 21 that we will consider equivalence classes of these curves to define the tangent vectors. So let's first define the set of curves. The notation will be CQM minus for the curves that start at Q. So the curves in the set are differentiable, but the domain is only given as the interval from zero to epsilon. Please note, this is the abstract notion of differentiability for manifolds, which we can naturally extend to manifolds with boundary. We just need to use charts to go to Rn or the half space in Rn. So you see, this interval is just an example of a one-dimensional manifold with boundary. Okay, and now in the same way, we can also consider the curves that go into the point Q. We call it CQ+, plus, and it looks completely the same, just our interval is mirrored. So you see, what we can do is to distinguish the direction of the tangent vectors and otherwise it's completely the same as we already know from part 21. In fact, we can also define the same equivalence relation, which means two curves should be the same if they have the same derivative if we go to the lower level with a chart H. And here please note, since the chart UH is defined on the boundary, we actually go through the half space with the chart. But there we have a nice curve in Rn, so we can calculate the derivative at the point zero. So again, as before, this equivalence relation says that the tangent vector of the corresponding curve is the same as for the other one if we go to the lower level. And now please recall that the tangent space by definition is the set of the equivalence classes. 
So with our notation we have to put all possible curves together and then we form the set of all equivalence classes. So this is the standard definition of the tension space, but now you see we can also consider subsets of that. So for example we could say that we have TQM plus when we only consider curves that end at the point Q. So in our picture these will be the tangent vectors that point outwards from the manifold. And on the other hand we could do the same with the minus sign and then we have the curves that start at Q which means we have tangent vectors that point inwards. But obviously we also have tangent vectors that lie in both sets, namely the ones that are tangent to the boundary. This means the intersection of both subsets here is not empty. In fact this intersection is what we would define as the tangent space of the boundary manifold. So please remember here what we have is a big tangent space where we also have subsets inside and the intersection of both subsets here gives us a smaller tangent space as a subspace. This whole thing is really important because in the following we will distinguish these different tangent vectors. In particular we want to speak of the outward pointing vectors and the inward pointing vectors. Hence we have to define two new subsets where we actually exclude this intersection. And to make the notation simple let's say we have T outward QM and T inward QM. And now we already know the first one would be T plus without the intersection and the second one T minus without the intersection. So you see we have a lot of definitions here but the last two are really important for us especially for Riemannian manifolds because there we can measure angles. To see that maybe we should extend the definition of a Riemannian manifold to manifolds with boundaries as well. Essentially it's the same definition because we just need an inner product in each tangent space. So we take a smooth manifold which now could have a boundary and also an inner product at each tangent space where the point P now can also lie on the boundary itself. And now the only thing we want is that the mapping from the point P to this inner product GP is a smooth map. And now you already know it, G is called a Riemannian metric and MG a Riemannian manifold now with boundary. Indeed if we have a boundary then it's easy to see that we can simply restrict the Riemannian metric to the boundary. This implies the manifold given by the boundary is a Riemannian manifold as well. However this one has no boundary anymore. But the important thing is that the boundary manifold is a sub-manifold in our original manifold M. This implies that we can define a so-called normal vector field. More precisely as you might remember we always want to have a continuous unit normal vector field. In our case this will be a mapping N from del M into the tangent bundle of M. Please recall the tangent bundle Tm is just the union of all tangent spaces of M. This means we can send a point Q from the boundary to a tangent vector in Tqm. However now we can claim that our normal vector should only be an outward pointing tangent vector in our tangent space. In fact it's a very special tangent vector because it should also be a normal vector. This means it's perpendicular to the tangent space given at Q for del M. So more precisely and Q is an element in the orthogonal complement of TQ del M. And there you see in order to talk about this orthogonal complement we definitely need a Riemannian metric to measure the angles. Moreover the Riemannian metric gives us a length notion as well and we want that this normal vector has length 1 at every point Q. So what we want is that the norm of n q is equal to 1. And now you already know this is what we call the unit normal vector field on del m. And now we also want that this is a continuous map and this actually makes it to a uniquely defined vector field. And the common name you see for that is the outward pointing unit normal vector field on del m. So you can remember such a Riemannian manifold with boundary always has such a nice normal vector field with outward pointing vectors. And in fact we can immediately use that to put a canonical orientation to the boundary as well. 
This is really important for Stokes' theorem because our integration has an orientation. So what we assume is that our manifold M has an orientation given and this is what we usually call positively orientated. And now what you should remember is that our boundary del M always inherits this orientation in the following way. So let's say we have a basis of tangent vectors of our boundary. This means we are one dimensional lower than the dimension of M, which we fix as N. So this is a given basis of TQ del M, and now this can be positively orientated or negatively orientated. And now what we do is to fix this term positively orientated with respect to the given orientation on M. So what we do is we shift the vectors to the right and at the first position we put our outward pointing unit normal vector field. Therefore this one is definitely a basis of the whole tangent space TQM, but now we say if this one is positively orientated then the other one is also called positively orientated. So the whole thing is quite simple, we just add this outward pointing normal vector to the beginning of the basis. To see what is happening here, maybe we look at the example sketch from the beginning. The boundary is a one dimensional manifold, so at the point Q, we only have one direction for the tangent vectors. However, for the whole manifold M, the tangent space is two dimensional and we also have our outward pointing normal vector. And at this point, if our orientation on M says that this combination here is a positively orientated basis of our tangent space, then the conclusion is that we have our positive orientation on the one dimensional boundary as well. So if this is del M, then we have tangent vectors going in this direction. And because of the continuity of our outward pointing unit normal vector field, we also know what happens to the orientation if we go to another point. In other words, what you can remember here is that the orientation on the boundary of M is totally fixed by the orientation on M. This will be really important for the formula in Stokes' theorem because there we will compare two integrations. Indeed, the two integrations over the boundary and over M are connected in some way. And obviously, if the orientation wasn't fixed, then we would have a problem with this sign on one side. Therefore, it's really important to remember how we transform the orientation from the manifold to its boundary. Okay, then I would say, let's continue our discussion into the direction of Stokes' theorem with the next videos. So I really hope I meet you there again, and have a nice day. Bye bye.